uh, Acts chapter 12. I want to begin in verse 5 uh, and read to verse number 11, reading from the Message Bible. Uh, let's read these verses together. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 through verse 11. All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him most strenuously. Can we read verse 5 again? Don't, don't, don't read too fast. I, I don't want you to miss this. In case my name was where Peter's name was. That's why I want you to read this a little more slowly. All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him strenuously. All right, I want to read it one more time, but this time instead of saying Peter, I want you to put Pastor Thorpe in there in verse 5. Don't put yourself in there. I don't want you in jail, uh, but, but I might go. Uh, so let's read verse 5 again. Instead of saying Peter, we're going to say Pastor Thorpe. All the time that Pastor Thorpe was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him strenuously. I sure hope y'all would. If Pastor was in jail, I hope you'd be praying. Verse 6. Then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. That night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby, and there were guards at the door keeping their eyes on the place. Herod was taking no chances. Suddenly there was an angel at his side, and light flooding the room. The angel shook Peter and got him up. Hurry! The handcuffs fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed. Put on your shoes. Peter did it. Then grab your coat and let's get out of here. Boy, I would have been glad to hear that. That was me. Verse 9. Peter followed him but didn't believe it was really an angel. He thought he was dreaming. Past the first guard and then the second, they came to the iron gate that led into the city. It swung open before them on its own, and they were out on the street, free as the breeze. At the first intersection, the angel left him, going on his way. That's when Peter realized it was no dream. I can't believe it. This really happened. The master sent his angel and rescued me, from Herod's vicious little production and the spectacle the Jewish mob was looking forward to. I want you to turn to your neighbor as safely as possible and ask them in the form of a question, does prayer really? Okay, y'all not ready. Okay, I'm going to try. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm going to let y'all blame it on me. Don't worry. All right, I want you to turn to your neighbor as safely as you can and ask them, does prayer really? change things. You got a name on the other side. Ask them, does prayer really change things? And somebody is shouting back in the spirit, prayer really does change things. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Does prayer really change things? One of the highest honors that I have ever had in this life was the privilege to carry on multiple conversations with Reverend Dr. Mac King Carter. He's now the late Reverend Dr. Mac King Carter. He went home to be with the Lord uh, in 2013. Uh, he is the only gospel preacher that I know of that when he passed, there were four different funerals to celebrate his home going. I highly recommend that you Google Dr. Carter, Reverend Dr. Mac King Carter, uh, who pastored the Mount Olive Church in Fort Lauderdale for decades. Uh, so one of the highest privileges that I have ever had was to carry on multiple conversations with him. 
Uh, one of the unique aspects of Dr. Carter's life is that he was personally acquainted with human suffering. Uh, Dr. Carter had been diagnosed with cancer four different times. Uh, he went into renal failure. That means his kidneys had shut down uh, and he was on dialysis. Uh, when he left us. He was literally receiving a dialysis treatment and lost consciousness during the procedure. Uh, one of the most uh, influential sermons that Dr. Carter uh, ever preached uh, was preached at the Salem uh, Bible Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and the sermon was taken from the book of Acts chapter 12. He entitled that sermon, mystery, mutilation, and miracle. Because when we began in verse 5, we began with the liberation of one of the leaders of the church whose name was Peter. We'll see in a few moments when we begin in verse 1 that before Peter was arrested and liberated, his partner in the ministry, James, got his head cut off. For those of you who are familiar with the New Testament, you will recall that during Jesus' earthly ministry, whenever he did significant things, he would take three specific disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. Two out of the three were arrested in Acts chapter 12 alone. James was arrested initially and got his head cut off in the early verses of this chapter. Then Peter was arrested and he too was facing execution. When Jesus went to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, he took three people into the room, Peter, James, and John. When Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration, he took with him three disciples, Peter, James, and John. On the night that Jesus was arrested, the night before his crucifixion, when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, he took three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And by the time we get to the book of Acts, chapter 12, James is assassinated and Peter is on the way. Uh, the assassination of James caught the church by surprise. But when Peter was put into prison, the Bible says in verse 5 that the church prayed strenuously on Peter's behalf. Dr. Carter describes this 12th chapter as the paradox of the inexplicable. What he means by that is some things are hard to explain. How does one disciple get his head cut off in one through four and another disciple is liberated in five down through verse 11? And that kind of paradox, Dr. Carter says, will drive you crazy. Why does God allow a tornado to hit a neighborhood, hit three houses, and then jump over house number four and hit house number five? I want to share with you that it is not necessarily because the people weren't praying in house number four. It is because sometimes the Lord moves in some mysterious ways. Because somebody in this room is wondering, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people while it appears that the wicked prosper at the same time? Some of you, okay, y'all going to be deep because we in black history, uh, but some of you, if you would uh, be willing to be honest, you have watched some of your neighbors, classmates, friends, and relatives, you have watched them prosper, and in the secret place of your heart, you ask, Lord, why did you do it for them and didn't do it for me? So, Pat, you know one of the things I've learned at this stage in my life? That I celebrate every time God blesses one of my neighbors. 
Because that's just evidence that God is in the neighborhood. <laughs> and if my house is on the same street, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. So what I want to do with Acts chapter 12, I want to talk some about the people in Acts chapter 12. And then I want to talk some about the prayers in Acts chapter 12. And see if we can answer this question, does prayer really change things? What do we know about the people in Acts chapter 12? Well, here's the first thing we know about them. These were praying people. These were praying people, which means the people in Acts chapter 12 who prayed for Peter even after they had lost James. These were not people who were just discovering the art or the practice of prayer. These people had a long history of praying. And you know that ought to be true of us. That we shouldn't be the kind of Christian who only prays when we get in trouble. Prayer ought to be a part of our regular occupation. Prayer should not be our last resort. Prayer ought to be our constant activity. These were some praying people. Well, really, to learn about their prayer life, you don't have to look in chapter 12. You can actually look into chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 25, we're given a, a, a strong idea of the prayer lives that these people had. Look at Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. The Bible says, Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. These were leaders in the church. He found him and brought him back to Antioch. They were there a whole year meeting with the church and teaching a lot of people. It was in Antioch that the disciples, for the first time, uh, were called Christians. It was about this time, don't miss this, it was about this time that some prophets came to Antioch from Jeru Jerusalem. One of them named Agabus stood up one day and prompted by the Spirit, warned that a severe famine was about to devastate the country. The famine eventually came during the rule of Claudius. Watch the disciples' response in verse 29. So the disciples decided that each of them would send whatever they could to their fellow Christians in Judea to help out. They sent Barnabas and Saul to deliver the collection to the leaders in Jerusalem. The point I'm trying to make in chapter 11 is that trouble did not catch them by surprise because they were praying people. They prayed. They fellowshiped with God on a regular basis. They prayed when the sun was shining, and they prayed when the rain began to fall. These were praying people. That's the first thing we learn about them. These were praying people. Here's the second thing we learn about them. Not only does the text prove that these were praying people, but secondly, watch this. I'm going to say it slow so you don't miss it. These were people. <laughs> say that, say this. Doesn't matter how much you pray, trouble will still show up at your address. I get so sick of people, not none of y'all, but some of y'all cousins. I, I get so sick of people who, who, who try to convince others that if you love God enough, bad stuff will never happen to you. Uh, a lot of times I watch Christian television. They got some bad brothers on Christian television. Uh, they, they so bad, they, they don't have, even have to lay hands on you. They can wave their coat at you. And you just fall out. I say to myself, that's got to be some kind of bad coat right there. Wave their coat at you and you just fall out. And what they try to tell you is, if you pray right, if you praise right, 
trouble will never show up at your address. And if you get in trouble, God will always bring you out. Well, how are we going to die? Because one day, all of us got to pack up and leave here. Jesus, in John chapter 11, goes to the tomb of Lazarus, raises him from the dead, even after he had been dead for four days. But one day, Lazarus had to die again. Stop trying to make me feel bad because dark clouds are hanging over my household. Because the truth is, if you live long enough, one day a storm will show up at your address too. And just because bad things happen to you don't mean that you're a bad person. Life just happens. So you saw them praying in Acts chapter 11. Watch what happens to them in Acts chapter 12. The Bible says that's when King Herod got it into his head to go after some of the church members. He murdered James, John's brother. Don't miss that. It, it is virtually unimaginable for us to identify with what James meant to the church. James was the brother of John. Uh, they, they're referred to often in Scripture. They were called the sons of thunder. They were biological brothers and brothers in the faith. James was one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and Herod, who was serving as governor of their region, in order for him to vex Christians, he took one of the top leaders in the church and executed him. Can you imagine showing up to church next Sunday, next Sunday only to discover that Pastor Thorpe was assassinated for simply being connected with Jesus Christ? That's why I get concerned about all these folks running around asking for all these titles. I'm cool with just being pastor. I'm cool with just being brother. I'm cool with just being servant because the bigger your title, the broader your target. <laughs> and all these folks in the Bible lived under threat of death on a constant basis. In verse 1 and in verse 2, James gets his head cut off. Watch Herod's further response. When he saw how much it raised his popularity rating with the Jews, he arrested Peter. All this during Passover week, mind you, and had him thrown in jail, putting four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. He was planning a public lynching after Passover. He killed James and saw that the enemies of Christianity rejoiced. And he said if they're rejoicing over the murder of James, how much more will they rejoice over the murder of Peter? This, is the, this all happened to the same group of people who were praying in Acts chapter 11. Their leader was assassinated in Acts Chapter 12, they were praying people, but they were still people. And I want to warn you with your peopley self <laughs> that even though you love Jesus, even though you pray, even though you are on your way to heaven, Christians get flat tires too. Amen. Christians get negative reports from doctors too. Christians get sick too. Christians pass away too. And don't think that you are any less of a believer because trouble showed up at your address. It just means you peopley. <laughs> you ought to know you peopley. You are peopley. These were praying people. These were people. Let me tell you a third thing about them. These were God's people. 
These were God's people. You see it in verse 5. These were God's people. Look at verse 5. All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him most strenuously. Peter was in prison, but the church was praying. And oh, if pastor ever ends up on lockdown, I pray y'all pray. Because <laughs> if you ever end up in trouble, I'm sure going to be praying for you. Hey, the further we get in the text, you discover that this prayer meeting went on in the home of a sister named Mary. Her brother's name was John Mark, who is responsible for writing the Gospel of Mark. They were praying at Sister Mary's house. We'll see in a moment that when Peter got out of jail, he went to the prayer meeting, knocked on the door, and they wouldn't let him in. Little girl named Rhoda came to the door, and uh, the church was praying for Peter. Peter shows up at the door. Rhoda answers the door, hears Peter's voice. Doesn't, she's so filled with excitement, she doesn't let him in. She goes back to where the people are praying and tells them that Peter is at the door and they tell her she is out of her mind. Now, Minister Lawson, that troubles me. W what were they praying for? Were they praying for Peter's liberation? Possibly. What makes me curious is if they were asking God to liberate Peter, why is it that when Peter showed up at the door, they didn't celebrate his liberation? Now, somebody will say, well, pastor, they must not have been praying in faith. No, I didn't live long enough to discover that when you get in trouble, all of your prayers ain't the same. This free him. I'm about to get full of my own cooking. Uh, if I get in trouble, I want everybody I know who know how to pray, I want them to be praying. But I don't necessarily need all y'all praying the same thing. <sighs> okay, yeah, okay, y'all gonna make my job hard. I want everybody praying. But I don't necessarily need everybody praying the same thing. Why? Because the Lord doesn't always move the same way. You didn't hear what I said. There, there, there was a lady uh, in a church that I'm very familiar with from decades ago. Her husband left her. And she served on the usher board. Uh, and when her husband left, the other ushers got word that her husband had left. And when the lady showed up to church that Sunday morning, before service, all the ushers were gathered together in a circle. Uh, and they motioned for her to come over to join the circle. And she said, well, what are we doing? They said, we praying. She said, what are we praying for? They said, we heard your husband left you, and we're praying for the Lord to send him back home. She said, don't pray that prayer. <laughs> she said, because I've been praying that the Lord will keep him gone. <laughs> Lord doesn't always work the same way. So I ask myself if I were a part of this first century church and I had three primary leaders Peter James and John one of them had already been assassinated and the other one was on death row about to be killed the following day what would I be praying now, you got to catch this. James just got his head cut off. What would I be praying if I heard that Peter got locked up and was facing execution too? Let me give you several possible things that they prayed. Here's one of the first things they may have prayed. Lord, give him strength. Give him strength. Sometimes when people get sick, when trouble shows up at their address, sometimes you pray, Lord, give 
him or her strength. Give them strength so that what they're going through, they will be able to handle. You know why you ought to pray for people's strength? Because sometimes the Lord doesn't move your mountains. He'll just give you the strength to climb. Lord, give him strength. Hey, let me give you a second one. A second way they may have been praying. Lord, give them strength. Somebody in the room hopefully was praying for Peter's family. Did y'all come to half church? It's one thing to pray for the person who's going through, but when you live long enough, you learn the value of praying for the people who are around them. Lord, give him strength. Lord, give them strength. Hey, here's another way somebody should have been praying. Lord, give us strength. Which means when we're done praying for Peter's biological family, we need to pray for Peter's spiritual family. Somebody in the room out of their honesty was saying, Lord, how are we going to handle this? We already lost James and it looks like we may lose Peter. Lord, give us strength. Lord, give us strength to make it through the night. Give us strength to make it through another day. Lord, give us strength. So I don't know how many people were in the room, but the house was packed. It was probably a big house. So let's say there were more than 100 people in there praying. Somebody was praying, Lord, give him strength. Lord, strengthen his biological family. Lord, strengthen his church family. But I'd like to believe that at least 10 to 30% of them were praying. Here's number four. Lord, get him out. Lord, get him out. Out. Now let me just throw this in for free. If I get sick and you get word that I'm sick, I want you to pray all them prayers. <laughs> every last one of them. I want to be covered on every side. Somebody will type that in the chat. Cover me. Cover me. Cover me. I want to be covered on every side. That means if I got to go through the sickness, Lord, make me strong. If my family's got to go through the sickness with me, Lord, make them strong. My church family, Lord, make us strong. But somebody in the building need to be praying, Lord, deliver him. Lord, get him out. Lord, if there be some other way, let this cup Pass from him, nevertheless, not our will, but let your will be done. Lord, get him out. Now watch this. One through four, James dies violently. Peter is arrested. He is chained to two Soldiers. There are a total of 16 soldiers guarding him. And at any moment, he is to get word that he is to lose his head just as James lost his head. What does Peter do while on death row? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 6. Then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. That night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby. And there were guards at the door keeping their eyes on the place. Herod was taking no chances. Watch this. Watch verse 7 and verse 8. Suddenly there was an angel at his side and light flooding the room. The angel, don't miss this, the angel shook Peter and got him up and said, hurry. The handcuffs fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed. 
Put on your shoes. So it's Ramona. Peter didn't fall asleep. He went to sleep. Y'all didn't come to have church. His partner James just got his head cut off. Peter gets locked up. And on his first night on death row, he slept like a baby. Now, he wasn't sitting up watching the door, waiting on deliverance, and just dozed off. No, no, no. Peter didn't fall asleep. He went to sleep. While chained to two soldiers. Hey, how do we know he went to sleep? He took his day clothes off. He took his shoes off. And even while chained, can you imagine Peter sleeping? Every time Peter turned over, they had to turn to. Every time Peter readjusted himself, they had to readjust too. Because Peter said, I'm going to sleep. I want to give you several reasons that Peter may have been sleeping. This first one is not a part of the printed outline that you have. Uh, I believe the first reason that Peter went to sleep, and again, it's not a part of the outline you already have, is because Peter's God neither sleeps nor slumbers. And Peter's conclusion had to be, since God is going to be up anyhow, ain't no need of me and God being up at the same time. That does lead me to the first thing I want to say as to why Peter was able to sleep. Hey, here's the first reason. He knew God was able. He knew that God was able. You can sleep when you know that God is able. The ability of God means even if he doesn't bring me out, it doesn't mean that he can't do it. You know why? I've seen him work. <laughs> I've seen him work. Remember, when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He took with him Peter, James, and John. When Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration, he took with him Peter, James, and John. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took with him Peter, James, and John. You know what Peter was saying when he slept on death row? I've seen this movie before, and I know how the end turns out. Peter says, I can sleep in the midst of stormy situations because I know God is able. Hey, that's not all. Peter says, I can sleep on death row not only because I know that God is able, but I can sleep on death row because I know that God is waiting. Peter says, like Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 that if I stay on this side I get to bless people but if I die and go to the other side God gets to bless me and Paul said I don't know which one I want more Paul said I don't know if I want to stay here and be a blessing to people or if I want to go to the other side and be in the presence of God Peter says well I fought a good fight Perhaps I finished my course. I have kept the faith. There's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. God is waiting on me. And Peter said, if I live or if I die, it's all right with me. I don't believe you heard what I said. Peter said, it's all right with me. If I stay, I get to stay in the comfort of those around me who enjoy my company and I enjoy theirs. But if I go, have you ever thought about the fact that we mourn everyone's passing? Everybody. Regardless of age, regardless of stage, we mourn everyone's passing. And we should. That's Biblical. But along with our mourning, the more we mature, we ought to find some place of thanksgiving. Think about all the stuff we got to deal with on this side. Have you watched the news? 
that you can be sitting up in your house in airplane parts, just start falling from the sky. Tr 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 trouble is everywhere. But where we are going, there's no sickness, no suffering, no pain, no disease. People don't lie on you over there. People don't talk about you over there. You don't get misunderstood over there. And Peter's conclusion was, I'm going on to sleep. Because God can do whatever he wants to when he get ready. And if he wants me to leave this life, when I leave it, I immediately go into his presence. God is able. God is waiting. Here's a third reason Peter could sleep on death row. Peter said, I know that James is waiting. Peter says, James went, and maybe I get to go and see James again. For them, the prophecy of Jesus had already been revealed that they would not only die, but they would suffer grievous deaths. And in Peter's mind, this may have been simply a fulfillment of prophecy and that one life would end and a new life would begin. So in verse 8, the angel tells him to get up. He gets dressed, puts on his shoes. Peter did it. Grab your coat. Let's get out of here. Peter followed him, but he didn't believe it was really an angel. He thought he was dreaming. Past the first guard and then the second, they came to the iron gate that led into the city. It swung open before them on its own. They were out on the street, free as a breeze. At the first intersection, the angel left him going his own way. That's when Peter realized it was no dream. I can't believe it. This really happened. The master sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's vicious little production and the spectacle the Jewish mob was looking forward to. Pastor, you've talked about the people. Can you say something about prayer? I will. Let me say two things. Here's the first one. I'm going to say it slow, not because y'all slow. I'm going to say it slow, not because y'all slow, but because I need to say it slow. The uh, reason I want to say this uh, so slowly, Bragana, is because y'all going to miss it when I say it. Not because you're slow. Because I just know y'all going to miss it. All right, so I'm going to say it slow, and then I'm going to give you another statement that may help you to understand it better. All right, so he, he, his statement, ain't but two words, but I'm going to say them slow. Ready for one? Yeah. one y'all ready for one? Yeah. All right, here it is. Slow, two words. Prayer works. I told y'all y'all were going to be slow. I already told you in advance y'all wasn't going to get it. I don't know why y'all think you got it. You don't have it. You don't have it. You think you got it, but you don't have it. Prayer works. I heard you. Amen. Amen. Show it up. Show it up. No, no. Let me say it this way. Prayer wears work clothes. So when I say prayer works, I'm using works in the verb form in its present perfect tense. I'm not saying that prayer is successful. I'm saying that prayer is active. Prayer works. Prayer wears work clothes. Which means prayer is not lazy. Prayer is active. Prayer does not wear Gucci, Prada, Louis Vuitton. Prayer got on dungarees, brogane shoes, overalls, a straw hat. Prayer carries a canteen. Prayer has a handkerchief to catch the sweat. Prayer ain't cute. Prayer works. It's, it's in verse 5. All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church 
prayed for him most strenuously. They were praying hard. Look at verse 12. Still shaking his head amazed, he went to Mary's house, the Mary who was John Mark's brother. The house was packed with praying friends. They weren't playing. They were praying. Can I ask you a question? What kind of clothes does your prayer life wear? Does your prayer life break a sweat? Have you ever lost your voice praying? Some of us, you'd be cute with our stuff. Father. In the King James Version, when Peter walked on water, he used 13 words to ask Jesus' permission. But when he started sinking, he took 10 of them back and just used three and said, Lord, save me. See, when you get in trouble, all your cuteness ought to vacate. <laughs> Why? Because prayer works. Look at verse 13 through verse 15. Verse 12 says the house was packed with praying friends. Here's, here's 13. When he knocked at the door to the courtyard, a young woman named Rhoda came to see who it was. But when she recognized his voice, Peter's voice, she was so excited and eager to tell everyone, uh, if everyone Peter was there, that she forgot to open the door and left him standing in the street. But they wouldn't believe her, dismissing her, dismissing her report. They told a lady, you, you done lost your mind. You're crazy, they said. She stuck by her story, insisting. They still wouldn't believe her and said it must be his angel. They were praying hard because they loved Peter just like they had loved James. They had lost James and they were either praying for Peter's liberation or they were praying that Peter would be strengthened to go through what he had to go through. Hey, in James chapter 5 in verse 16, the Bible says the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much, which means your prayers can't be pretty, they ought to be gritty. Because you can be honest with God. The Lord, I know you brought me out before, but this new place I'm in, I've never seen before. And if you don't help me, I can't stand the storm. Now, here, here's what I find to be interesting, bro, Rob. God delivered Peter, but it does not appear that everybody was praying for Peter's deliverance. Because when Peter got delivered and showed up at the door, not only would they not let him in, they said that can be Peter, it must be his angel. They had a belief in that day that people were assigned guardian angels and guardian angels could take on the form of that person. So why would God deliver Peter and that's not specifically the prayer that they were praying? Could it be that the Lord rewards the faithfulness of prayer more than he does the accuracy of prayer. You didn't hear what I said. I'm full of my own cooking. Sometimes when you pray, you don't know what to ask for. I wish I had somebody who's been there. Wish I had somebody who has been at a place that you didn't know what to ask for, but you knew how to say, God, I'm coming to you with all that I have. I'm coming to you with all that I am. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know if you're going to do it. But whatever you want to do, God, you can have all of me in exchange for all of you. And could it be that sometimes you're so busy trying to be cute and accurate until you're not passionate enough? 
If I'm in a building and the building is on fire, it's good if you know where the blueprints of the building are. But can you get a fire extinguisher? Can you punch a hole in a wall? That's the kind of people I want to run with. See, some of your friends are deep. And when you get in trouble, they're trying to find a plan. To hit. No, that, that's good. You need some people on your team like that. But I need some radical people too. I need somebody who's going to say, let's call 911. That's cool. I also need some thuggish people who can say, which windows we breaking out? The man was invited to a church. And once he got into the building, they locked all the doors. They pulled out a basket. People came out with flutes, started playing the flutes, opened the baskets. Snakes started coming up at the baskets. The fellow said to the man who had invited him, where is your back door? The man said, we don't have a back door. He responded, where y'all want one? Because y'all finna get one. That's the kind of people I need rolling with me. I need some blueprint saints. But I need some thugged out saints who will take off a Louboutin high heel shoe and beat a hole through the drywall. Did you have some? <laughs> you need some people thugged out for Jesus. Which means sometimes you don't have to give the Lord the words, just give him the letters and let him put the words together. You didn't hear what I said. Sometimes you can't be all that deep. You don't know what to pray, Romans chapter 8 tells us. But when you go to God fervently in prayer, believing that he's able to do all things but fail, he can make a way out of no way. Prayer works. Prayer wears work clothes. All right, that's the first thing I want to say about prayer. Here's the last thing. First one is this. Prayer works. Here's the second one. I'm going to say it slow. Is second. Prayer works. <laughs> I say prayer works the first time, that's in the perfect present tense. When I say prayer works the second time, that's in the perfect past and future tense. Which means not only does prayer wear work clothes, but prayer proves that God can do all things but fail. Prayer works, which means he can get you out. While he's getting you out, he can make you strong. While he's on the way bringing you out, he can strengthen your biological family and your spiritual family. He can do it all at the same time, which means if I stay, God is good. If I go, he's just as good. Because even though Peter is liberated in Acts chapter 12, one day he still had to die. And the Lord will keep you here until his word is established. And until you accomplish all that he has for you to accomplish. In verse 16 down through verse 19, the Bible records Peter's full liberation. Watch what you find in verse 16. All this time Poor Peter was standing out in the street, knocking away. Finally, they opened up and saw him and went, wow. That's what believers ought to do when the Lord answers their prayer, however he answered it. The saints ought to go, wow. Peter put his hands up and calmed them down. He described how the master had gotten him out of jail. Then said, tell James's or, or, or tell James and the brothers, this is James, the brother of Jesus, not the James who had already been killed. Tell James and the brothers what happened. He left them and went off to another place. At daybreak, the jail was in an uproar. Where is Peter? What's happened to Peter? When Herod sent for him, they could neither produce him nor explain why not. He ordered their execution. Off with their heads, fed up with Judea and the Jews, he went for a vacation in Caesarea. That's when you get to verse 19. When you go home and read verse 20 through verse 23, 
you discover that this same Herod who thought he was Mr. Big Stuff discovered that it doesn't matter how high you get, you'll still be looking up to God. Let me just say this for all your haters, for all your enemies. They can't hurt you unless God gives them permission. Did you hear what I said? Nothing can come to you unless God gives permission in the first place. Because the same Herod who killed James, the same Herod who arrested Peter, in verse 20 through verse 23, God got tired of him and allowed worms to eat him alive. What am I saying? Don't tell me what God can't do. He can do whatever he wants to whenever he gets ready. Don't miss that. That means that if you are in trouble, either God is going to bring you out or he's going to use your trouble for his own glory. But I, I, I watched the movie. I read the back of the book. And I win. Did you hear what I said? I win. One of the worst movies that Charlene and I ever saw uh, was a movie, The Perfect Storm, starring George Clooney. It's based on a true story about the collision of three hurricanes that occurred uh, in the ocean for commercial fishermen. And the whole time I'm watching the movie, and they go to the funeral scene because the bodies were not recovered. They go to the funeral scene, and I'm just waiting for the doors to burst open and for George Clooney and his partners to walk in. Only to discover that before I watched the movie, I should have read the book. Because if I read the book or read the history, I would have known that they did not survive. They perished in watery graves. And for them on this side, the ending was not a good ending. But I, I read this book. I, I know the end of my story. And the end of my story says it doesn't matter what I go through on this side. What I'm going to is better than what I'm leaving from. And if the Lord doesn't bring me out of my trouble, he'll get in my trouble with me. <laughs> I wish I had somebody who knew what I was talking about. If the Lord doesn't bring you out, he will get in it with you. And whatever you have on the other side is better than what you have on this side.